In mid-1941, the US Navy faced something of a crisis. Almost everyone recognised war was coming, but at the current forecast rates of production, the new Essex class wouldn't be entering active service until 1944. Before that, the US Navy's only fast carrier hull that would come into service would be USS Hornet, which would give the US Navy a total of five full-sized carriers, plus Wasp and maybe Ranger. Meanwhile, both of the interwar fleet exercises and British experience to date suggested that carriers were somewhat vulnerable glass cannons. The Japanese Navy, on the other hand, had six large fast carriers and a significant array of smaller carriers as well as conversions either built or coming down the line fairly soon. And so President Roosevelt suggested quickly converting some cruiser hulls into light fleet carriers to boost the numbers in case war came sooner rather than later. Initially, the Navy General Board rejected the idea, suggesting that such vessels would be expensive, of limited effectiveness, and they probably wouldn't be ready much earlier than the Essexes anyway. This argument went back and forth for the rest of 1941 until, right after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, a small gap in the board's defences appeared. The Bureau of Ships pointed out that their objections were based on redesigning a cruiser hull into a full-spec mini-carrier. But, if everyone was prepared to accept a slightly less than perfect conversion, more akin to some of the recent work they'd done on escort carriers, then the job could be done much faster. Roosevelt pounced on this, and on the 3rd of January 1942, the Bureau of Ships began to work on their new design, taking the hull of a Cleveland-class cruiser down to the main deck, removing almost everything above this, and then sticking on a hangar deck that would run between the two deck elevators, thus creating a neat little box. This hangar would be as high as those found aboard the fleet carriers, which would allow for the same aircraft to be operated. But due to the lighter girders that needed to be used to avoid stability issues, no aircraft could be hung from the hangar ceiling. But even with a minimal island and no heavy anti-aircraft or dual-purpose guns, the fine lines of the cruiser threatened to have stability issues still and so a large blister was added to the hull, which had the happy effect of offering a bunch more volume to stick aviation fuel in, presumably as long as nothing explosive hit that general area of the ship. Indeed, at first, they tried to eliminate the island altogether, but the need for radar and a crane to be present on deck anyway, along with the loss of hangar space caused by trying to truck the exhaust gases from the boilers all the way aft, meant that a small island that concentrated all of these things in one place turned out to be the best solution. At first, the air group had been thought of as essentially a full-strength fleet carrier fighter unit, or VMF, along with a handful of strike aircraft. Ironically, this was revised to include far more strike aircraft and fewer fighters during the design and build process, only to end up back at lots of fighters and a relatively few strike aircraft later in the ship's wartime careers. Other armament was sketched as 16 40mm Bofors in eight twin mounts and 16 single 20mm Orlicans, with the very first of the class, USS Independence, also starting life with a pair of single 5-inch 38s, but these were very quickly replaced at the request of her captain with two quad 40mm Bofors installations. As the war went on, more anti-aircraft guns would be added, but the balance between Bofors and Orlicans would tilt heavily in favour of the 40mm gun, on all ships to varying degrees. At first, there was also a single catapult fitted, and this was changed later to two. Capable of around 31.5 knots, a total of nine independence class light carriers would be built. Initially, there were thoughts about building another batch in 1943, as Admiral King believed that with their minimal levels of protection, the class was sure to suffer quite a few casualties. But, as the Essex-class production lines were sped up and they began to enter service sooner than expected, it turned out that the independences, although at times damaged, would end up only suffering a single hull loss, the USS Princeton being hit in late 1944 by a D-4Y duty, the bane of a number of US carriers in the late war period, and then later sinking due to a combination of internal fires and explosions and external torpedoes from the destroyer USS Reno. All nine ships entered service in 1943, 
as it turned out, this was actually pretty much alongside the Essexes, as had originally been guessed, just a year earlier than anyone had thought possible, and they would go on to participate in a number of key actions, including, but not limited to, the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Battle of the Philippine Sea, the sinking of the Yamato, and various attacks on the Japanese home islands. Some of their number would also end up being caught up in Typhoon Cobra, uh, with quite damaging results. However, by the end of World War II, the introduction of newer and larger aircraft meant that the independences were largely surplus to requirements. Independence herself was used in Operation Crossroads, and later scuttled as too radioactive for much other use. Belleau Wood and Langley had brief spells in the French Navy in the 1950s, whilst Monterey became a training ship. Bataan was briefly an anti-submarine warfare carrier, San Jacinto and Cowpens never left the reserves after 1947, and all of these were scrapped between the end of the 1950s and the start of the 1970s. This left Cabo, which, like Bataan, was briefly an anti-sub carrier, before being sold to Spain as the Didalo, operating helicopters and later AV-8 Harrier jump jets. This lasted until 1989, when she was returned to the US for use as a museum ship, but preservation efforts throughout the 1990s failed, and she was sent to the scrapyard in 1999. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.